Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to review this sword right here. It is a Ronin Dojo Pro number 30. And a couple quick disclaimers before I get into it. One, this is a review sample from Ronin Katana. I didn't spend any money on it. If you think that makes me biased, you know, at the start. And two, I do study Japanese swordsmanship, and it might not be apparent from the way you see me swinging around, but I'm trying, I'm learning. I'm still a novice, though, so you should keep that in the back of your mind while you're, well, actually, you should keep it in the front of your mind while you hear me babble on about the thing. Uh, other notes that are worth considering, this is a $300 sword, so it's not millions of dollars or thousands of dollars, it's 300 bucks. Uh, specifications and links and all that will be in the description down below if you're interested in picking one up. I should also note my bias here, and that is that I have tested Ronin Katanas before, I've tested the Dojo Pro line before, not this specific model, and I've thought of them quite highly. Uh, they hold a place in my mind where they're easy recommendations to people that want something for backyard fun or a sword that is inexpensive but very very resilient and as i think about the experiences of had breaking swords these really stand out as very durable products or have in the past and that's why i was really interested in doing this review again or revisiting the dojo pro uh, one because i have a soft spot for them right but two i want to see how they hold up with the methods that i do now it, it takes me fewer licks to get to the center of a tootsie pop right when i want to break a sword i can do it a little bit more efficiently than i did you know, closer to a decade ago. So I wanted to see how it held up, and that's what this video is going to show. Hopefully it lets you know if it's worth your hard-earned money or not. I suppose a spoiler alert, it did hold up really well. Not perfectly, there are some things that I would like to see addressed, but at the same time, uh, I whacked the sword into a metal stake and it took, <laughs> it took a lot of smacks to get to the center of it. You'll see that towards the end of the video. Anyway, I like to start my reviews with the pommel, the kashra, the end bit right here. Ronin Katana uses some pretty simple fittings. I happen to like them. There's not a whole lot to really critique here. They have little shitadome that are glued in and fixed in place so they don't move around. The kashra, as you might notice, has come off. Uh, that came off a little bit sooner than I would like, and if there's one critique I could give, it has to do with the Edo tightness and how this uh, kashra came off. But uh, I like the fittings. They're simple. They appear relatively thick and reasonably well-made. For $300, I'm not expecting a lot, and frankly, I don't really like it when lavish embellished fittings are put on a sword in this price point because they're usually subpar and, and kind of muddy shadows of what they're trying to emulate. Doing a simple set of fittings, uh, I, it's easier to nail. I think it probably costs a little bit less and at the same time it, it's harder to spot flaws and issues or take issue with it. Also it's simple and pragmatic and I, I certainly don't mind that aesthetic. So uh, anyway, simple kashra. It's on there. The thing that I would note, though, is that the kashra, it was glued on, and you can see some of the resin and residue that are left in here, but it did come off eventually. It took some aggressive testing to get it off, but at the same time, the ito started coming undone, and if I were a smarter man, or I was testing this in such a way where I, I felt fixing it would be, be appropriate, I didn't feel that it was in this particular case, uh, you, I could have caught it, and I could have tightened it or glued it or made it so the kashra wouldn't have come off. Uh, but I didn't do that. I didn't think it would be fair. I don't generally repair katanas mid-review, so I, I didn't do that in this case either. Um, that does bring us, though, to the, the Ito. And this is the, the kind of main culprit for, for what could be improved in the, in the sword. Uh, now, the diamonds themselves, they do wander a little bit. They're pretty par for the course in swords around this price point. There are swords that have done it better, um, but there are certainly, certainly swords that I've seen with, with worse Ito. Uh, the Ito is a little bit on the loose side, though, so I can displace this like maybe two to three uh, in some places, uh, maybe even more than that. Now, I can't completely shift the diamonds and have them stay. I can't push the Ito on the side and have it displaced even after the, the handle has been abused, um, but it is loose in some spots. And what started to happen after just doing Eido is that the knot started to come undone just a little bit. Now. If you were buying the sword and using it and the knot started coming undone, you, you would hopefully have time to notice before it came undone or frayed or the kashra came off. And I could have, you know, basically pulled the, the knot tighter again while it was still tied, uh, glued it, stitched it, done something to keep it secure, and I, I didn't do that. So I had the opportunity to, I just didn't. Um, anyway, by not doing that, when I went to abusive testing, the kashra came off and it, it didn't come all the way undone, though. Uh, the The cross pattern that they use on the Idomaki here held it in place and I could tie it on and you know keep it going to the point that I could destroy the blade but uh, the kashra did come off it has a lot to do with the Ito tightness and so if there were one thing that could be improved here I do think that tying the Ito a bit tighter would be would be really nice to see if that doesn't happen and you end up getting a dojo pro anyway I've heard that 
pushing wax or something like that into this sometimes can cause it to tighten. Uh, the sweat from my hands and usage actually has caused it a little bit to tighten over time as well, though not, not enough, I would say. And if I wanted to, my usual recommendation is take some lacquer and spray it, and it tends to not make it feel terribly comfortable in your hands, but at the same time, it locks things into place, and they don't tend to come undone after you lacquer them. Anyway, um, Ito, a little bit loose. The panels on here as well, they're apparent. They're not bulging, though, so sometimes you can very easily make out the panel line of the Samegawa underneath here. I don't see that here, so that's, that's at least nice. And the handle shape is reasonably comfortable. It has a synthetic silk feel. I didn't find that to be problematic or slippery while I was moving it around, though. That's my preference. The, as in some people I've, I've heard have found this, this silk to be a little bit on the slippery side. I didn't find that to be the case. The nodules in the Samegawa are small, and in some places I can push the diamonds around and kind of see where the panel is. It does appear to be recessed in the handle rather than just laid on top. Um, there's white Samegawa underneath here, obviously, so I can see the nodules reasonably well. I can make out that they're on the smaller side. These Minuki on here also stayed in place, which is important. With the Ito loosening, I was kind of expecting to lose this bottom one here. It did stay in place. Uh, they do draw my eye a little bit, though not so much on the kind of goldish color on the white over the black, along with the kind of sepa, don't make my eye instantly jump here. So it has this very classic contemporary katana, or not contemporary, very classic katana look uh, with the black silk and little dabs of gold here and there. Anyway, uh, aesthetic, is, aesthetic is simple, but I, I do happen to, to like it. If I move on to the Actually, before I move on, I should talk about the Ito and how it transitioned to the Fuchi when it was actually tied on there. It was a little bunchy towards the end down here. The knot was not fantastic, and it was not particularly well done down at the Fuchi area. The transition up here, uh, I'm sorry, at the Kashra, it was not particularly well done. At the Fuchi here, the transitions are actually pretty good. Uh, there's a slight ledge on one side. Apart from that, they line up, and I didn't experience any discomfort. If I move on to the Suba, this is a swirly Mitsudome Suba, and it's one that I've, I've seen a number of times, but on this particular one, it's got some like hammer marks on it, which make it somewhat unique and not something that I see on every other sword out there. I happen to really like this theme. That's why I asked Ronan to send the, the Dojo Pro number 30 was because of this Suba, and I, I do like it. Now, this particular one has big openings that you could kind of stick your finger through. I didn't actually find that my hands ever gravitated or got stuck or anything like that. The ledges are crisp here. Um, they're maybe sharper than I would I would like them to be. At the same time, they don't cut me. If I press my hand on them, I can't get a nail to bite into them. Um, so they are rounded at least enough, but they are still a little on the sharp side. So be beware. If you have smaller fingers, then maybe, maybe that would be a problem. Uh, in my case, though, I, it never ended up biting me, which I was I was really looking for. I did choke up on the grip. I did try to get it to, but at no time did my hands get caught in a way that caused any discomfort. I'll talk about the habaki up here now. So Ronan puts on this kind of patterned habaki here. I happen to like it. It makes it a little different than the average brass habaki, though I have seen this one a number of times now. Uh, over some of the abuse, it did develop a slight shift and rattle in the habaki, that's that's about it. The rest of the handle is actually still pretty tight. The habaki moves around and the kashra came off, but <laughs> considering what I did to it, that's that's not so bad. Uh, the the sword tensioned pretty well. It was even a little bit on the not loose, but it was not it was lighter than I guess it could have been. And I did use it quite a bit over the last month or so, and it loosened up to the point that uh, it comes out pretty easily now. It doesn't really lock in place unless I really kind of shove it in there. And even then, it's, it's still a pretty loose fit. So a shim would have been, uh, would be needed at more or less this point to, to get it to be the right tightness. Uh, it could be a little more appropriate sized, but I, that might be luck of the draw on this one. It was reasonably well tensioned when I got it. It just happened to, to wear down a little bit quickly. Um, and yeah, a shim, a shim would resolve it. So that, that could be a little better. Uh, if I talk about the Saya though, as I noted, transitions here to the Fuji area, I think are handsome, it looks nice. The lacquer on the Saya is nice. It doesn't have any profile taper on the Saya, but the lacquer work is, is clean and nice. And I can clearly make out the horn, horn Kojiri here. It's not painted over, but it's a dark horn, and I can, I can clearly make out that it's horn. And I like the look of horn. I'd rather they don't paint it because I, I like the, the aesthetic appeal of the horn. Uh, the Kurigata is buffed horn as well, but I can see that it's like a nice dark horn color. 
Uh, there were shiridome. In this case, Ronin tried to glue them in. One side stayed glued in, the other came out and kind of flopped around. I don't like it when shiridome come out and bounce around and scuff my very nicely lacquered scabbard. Um, so not a fan that one of them came out, but I do, I do want to, you know, give a tip of the hat that they're the only sword company that I've seen in the $300 price point that glues these things in. Well, they might not be the only one, but they're it's certainly few and far between that people take the time to put a dab of glue here. In this case, the dab didn't hold, but I, I appreciate that the attempt was made nonetheless. Anyway, um, other bits about the scabbard. Uh, when it was there, it actually drew pretty well. Uh, they ship as well in some sort of uh, wax substance, and I did find this to be irritating. I've heard that if I leave the, the scabbard outside in the sun that the wax can melt a little bit and it doesn't cause the same issue. I tried it. It's still actually pretty cold outside, so it didn't work very well, and I kept having kind of waxy residue come out on the sword. I cleaned it off several times, but as I was doing Iido, it did get to be a little bit of an irritation that I would put the sword in and then there'd be some waxy goobs on it. Uh, I know that that's put in there to protect the sword and keep it from rusting, but using it in a dojo for Iido, I found that to be something of an irritation. Uh, perhaps it'll stop after a time, or maybe if it gets warm, I could actually test the scabbard and see if it stops, you know, putting boogers on the sword. But uh, the wax does come off on the sword and the scabbard a little bit. Again, I, I think that um, some of them probably come a little bit tighter. A shim would resolve this, and it was pretty quiet in actually drawing and sheathing, and overall a reasonably comfortable sword to, to use for Iido. Let's talk about the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part. Well, there's not a hamon or a hada, um, but what the sword did have was clean planes. It doesn't have them anymore, uh, but the, the planes of the blade are flat. The shinogi was actually uh, reasonably well profiled. It's not as soft as I've seen in other swords. It had a more or less satin kind of finish, uh, not quite a mirror polish, but it makes me feel like if I wanted to buff it or use a ultra fine scotch pad or something like that, that it wouldn't deter from the polish too much. Uh, there's really not a whole lot to say polish wise. It came stupid sharp. Um, it has, has a very keen edge on it yet in most places, <laughs> at least this part of the blade is still very, very sharp. Um, I've, I used it to sharpen the, the pegs for the tatami stand. Yeah, it, it came wicked, wicked sharp. And um, the other bit to note about the blade, uh, there is a yakote, or at least an attempt at one. Let me see if I can put this down here without it falling and hurting me. Uh, the sword does have a yakote. It's not a geometric one. It's just sanded on a little different. The kasaki was very sharp all the way up to the tip. Um, and I liked this little feature on the kasaki, which might be hard to make out, but it swells. It has a nice kind of reinforced kasaki diamond tip section. Again, this isn't something that I see on every sword for $300. Most of the time they're just ground uh, smooth in this area, and this kind of reinforced spearhead kasaki type thing isn't something that's put on a lot of swords. So I like that I, I saw it here. I thought it would be a little louder in practice. I had a lot of trouble hearing it. It wasn't a particularly loud sword, but usually this little tip whistles through the air uh, a little more noisily than if you if you don't have it. But I didn't find it to be particularly audible while I was practicing with it. Anyway, I suppose that brings me to the part where I talk about practicing with it. Uh, so I did practice quite a bit. I used it more or less every time I did Iido for, for a month. Um, and it was a very comfortable experience. Again, I noted that the, the little boogers that it would pick up from the, from the scabbard were irritating. It happened less in snow uh, when, I was, when I was practicing. I have the time that I have to film. Went outside and, and filmed Iido in the snow, and I didn't notice the little booger bits on there then. Maybe it's because it was wet or cold and didn't pick them up the same way. What I did notice pretty quick, though, was that the, the Ito frayed a little bit towards the Kashra, and that's when I thought, well, you know, if, if I had bought this sword and I was using it, I would stitch it and maybe put a dab of glue on it to keep it secure. I, I didn't opt to do that, but it didn't get much worse in using it. The Kashra glue uh, held on pretty well, and I didn't notice anything. It just kind of gradually got a little bit more loose, but it was still kind of stuck in there uh, while I was doing Iido. It happened pretty quick, though. I want to say maybe the, the second day of using this for Iido, I noticed that it started to come untied just a little bit, and it stayed that way more or less for the month, and it didn't come out any further until I abused it to the point of failure, and it took beating it against a log to do it. But for Iido, it was very, very comfortable to use. I enjoyed the experience. Again, the, the little booger bits were somewhat irritating at times, but uh, it drew well. It was a comfortable sword to use, and I, it's lighter and more balanced than I really recall 
the Dojo Po Bing. And I haven't tested this model. I know there's some that are a little different, but in this particular case, it was a more nimble and comfortable sword. It's a little short for me, uh, but it had a swirly Mitsudome on it, so that's why I requested this one. And I, I really enjoyed the process of moving it around. It was, it was a joy to train with. Uh, the Ito was a little bit on the loose side. I found that it did tighten slightly, particularly when it got wet. Um, it tightened up a little bit. Uh, so it didn't feel in such a way that I felt out of control in my hand. If I hold on to the handle and twist it around, it remains locked in my hand. Um, it wasn't so loose that I found it to be worrying, but it is still a point that I would say should be addressed. Uh, the, the one biggest facet of the sword that I think could be fixed. If I talk about cutting now, well, cutting was lots of fun. I did tatami mats, I did water bottles, I did pool noodles, I did a shaving cream, I did lots of different things. And more or less, uh, it popped pool noodles apart. It was a obscenely sharp, <laughs> very, very keen, right out of the box, and did a great job with pool noodles. Water bottles as well, it popped those apart. I cut it in the neck of some bottles, and I didn't notice any, any issues, any scratches, even on the blade. Uh, I didn't notice that the very keen fine edge after cutting into the water bottles was diminished. It has a pretty fine edge on it, so it, I wouldn't really hold it against it if it did uh, lose or, or you know, bend or have some sort of deflection, but it held tight all the way through water bottle testing. Tatami mats, it was very easy to cut with. I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, it really stood out as a very clean tatami cutter. I was actually really surprised at how well it cut tatami. Um, not, not necessarily quite as well as like a competition cutter, but approaching that territory, it was actually a very, very effective cutter. Um, anyway, then I moved on to some more abusive stuff. That was the fun stuff. Abusive stuff, if I cut into a metal can, the, the uh, shaving cream, it did leave a little bit of edge damage, very small, and some scratching on the surface. Uh, from there, I, I cut some other, you know, odds and ends, some fun stuff, uh, but it wasn't until I went to the log and really tried to chop through it and use it like an axe. It did that actually really, really well. But at the same time, I noticed after a few strikes, I did lose the kasha it came off. So I put it in my pocket and kind of moved on and gradually a little wrong would come undone and I'd, I'd go through the process of tightening it. But it cut through the log and I didn't notice any edge issues. It still had a very keen kind of paper cutting, razor, hair popping <laughs> type sharpness. So at this point, I do want to point out that I was I was pretty impressed by this. I thought that uh, maintaining the edge sharpness through cutting a log uh, and and maintaining kind of that really keen refined edge where I can still shave with it was was really quite impressive. I did think that that was good edge retention, and I I didn't expect that to necessarily be the case because again, I did whack it into a metal can and I did chop through a a pretty thick branch with it, which is dry at this point and not particularly easy to cut and had some knots and stuff in it. So I was impressed that it did those things. Uh, from there, I tried bending the sword. Now, this one doesn't fit into my stand as easy to bend anymore. I've secured it so I can put pegs in it, but I did put it on a tree and try to bend it back and forth. I did stick it in the ground and bend it back and forth. And I did as well. Um, very often when I do that, they do spring back to shape. It's not particularly surprising when they do that braced in a stand. But if I take it and strike the flat really hard against the stand, most swords, even spring steel swords, bend. This one didn't. I smacked it pretty hard several times, and every time it just sprung right back to shape. There were no bends, no twists. It seemed to, to pop back into shape. And I, I would say that that's one thing that most swords I've tested haven't done. Again, even spring steel robust blades, if I strike them hard enough, uh, they, they tend to you know, take some sort of set. Uh, even large long swords and things like that with a lot of fullering or really thick robust swords, they all tend to take a little bit of a set when I smack them on the corner of my stand really hard. And this, this didn't, so I, I thought that was actually kind of surprising. That was a new one for me, because I did really think that I was going to get it to bend. Anyway, um, so after doing that, I tried a new target, and that was bone. <laughs> and that might have been a little ambitious. Uh, I don't usually cut these. These are uh, short ribs. They're beef, beef ribs from from dinner a while ago, and I just thought, why not give them, a, give them a whack? And they did start to really diminish the edge. A lot of the edge deformation that you see on the sword really came from the bones. I had six of them. It split them in half, and but they were really hard, and they caused quite a lot of edge deflection. Now, the edge didn't chip and spray off, but in a lot of places, it did roll over. It still cut the bones, but at the same time, there was a price to be paid for it. After cutting the bones, I thought, well, I'm, I'm in for a penny and for a pound. Let's push it all the way. Uh, and I, I did some more things. I threw it at a tree, no problems. Didn't notice really any rattle uh, popping up. The habaki, I think, started to loosen at that point. But that was about the only thing that I, I could say really happened as a consequence of throwing it at a tree. Um, no bends, no issues, no breaking, no, no other bits.
so then I brought it out to the croquet stake of doom. And here is where I do want to point out I'm, I'm being pretty aggressive right out of the gate. Sometimes I start and I, I do some light wax, and I didn't have a lot of light wax with this one. So several strikes, and then I reversed the blade, turned it around, struck it on the spine, which is a recipe to break the sword. In my heart, I really hoped that it wouldn't break here. <laughs> In my mind, I thought, like, this is, this is going to go further. But a couple strikes on the spine, and it did break. Uh, so I've, I've gotten better at breaking swords. I really hope that it didn't, but it did. And the fact that it made it that far to, you know, cutting through bone, chopping a log, uh, being thrown thrown across <laughs> across my yard several times into a tree, all of this is, is very good performance. It held an edge really well. Uh, it did really good at cutting. It was a pretty resilient sword. It didn't bend. Uh, but when it came to the croquet stake of doom, it broke like a lot of other swords did. So, um, that, I guess, is, is really all the testing. What I can say from that is I do think that as I look at the grain structure, it appears, it appears pretty tight. There's not uh, a particularly rough or, or coarse grain structure that I'm able to see as I compare it to some of the other swords that I break in, uh, broke anyway, <laughs> that I broke in. It appears to be a smaller and tighter grain structure for what that's worth. Um, it held up well. I was impressed at the edge retention and the ability, and I was impressed at the edge retention cutting through a log. Uh, I was impressed that it didn't lose the biting edge and cutting through a metal can. Uh, sometimes the really just the finest points at the edge get lost on that. I was also surprised that it didn't bend, but I was a little disappointed that it broke more or less like a lot of the other swords do. It fell to the croquet stake of doom after having a lot of edge defamation done to one side and then being turned around and struck on the spine. Uh, lots of swords break that way, and this, this was one of them. But it didn't break before that. It made it all the way to being struck on the spine, which was an accomplishment. So. I still think it's a very good sword. I still think it holds up. I still think it is a very resilient and durable sword. Uh, the edge retention and the lack of bending are, are some new facets that I don't think I really showcased as well in some previous videos that I did, but uh, those, those are some feedback that I have for this one. It was also a little better balanced. I, this was a fun sword to use for Iido. It's, it's still a bit on the tip heavy side, still a little on the, on the uh, choppy chop side, still, still has some, some mass to it, but at the same time, it's not clubbish or brutish, uh, so I, I did enjoy training with it as well. All right, sword friends, that's all the video that I have. That's all the information that I can give you, and hopefully it's enough to help you decide if it's worth your 300 bucks or not. Uh, for me personally, do I think it's worth it? Yes, it's still an easy thing to recommend, at least to folks that are gonna go and have fun and do some choppy chop stuff in the backyard, uh, or if you want a resilient and forgiving cutter in the dojo. Now, the, the Ito is a bit of a concern, and I'm not gonna really it's, it's getting a pass, but, you know, kind of by the skin of its teeth, so to speak. Uh, the Ito didn't really come undone until I was doing really, really heavy test cutting. If it did more, then I, I might change my tune a little bit because loose Ito is a problem. It tightened up a little bit, and so it doesn't show as much in the video as it did uh, when I first took it out of the box. But a little bit of lacquer or wax supposedly might tighten this up. And if, if you are okay with doing that or if Ronig Tana uh, tightens this up, then what you get is a blade that came out of the box very sharp, was actually, you know, despite being, you know, tip heavy in a fun way, uh, it still moved around, it was a joy to cut with, it maintained its edge really well, it was very forgiving as well, it didn't bend very easily, which is something that's important when you get this stuck in logs, branches, or when you're trying to tommy and have some bad cuts, those can bend blades. And this was pretty resilient to bending, which I was very happy to see. Uh, so yes, it's still an easy thing for me to recommend for $300. Uh, I would also like to avoid the boogers and the saya. I like to do Iido with it, and it's not fun to, to get wax out of the scabbard. Uh, if there's a way to resolve that, I, I guess I'm going to keep trying the sun and melting the wax and <laughs> getting it out of the scabbard. I'll let you know how that turns out. But still, regardless, I think there's a lot of fun sword here, and I like the edge, I like how it moved, and I still think it's a very, very durable, very resilient sword for the money. So yes, it's an easy one for rec to recommend for me. Anyway, uh, that's all I've got. Hopefully it's been helpful. Cheers, and thanks for watching.